Dangerous Assignment, transcribed starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to prove that you can sometimes hit a home run with the swing of a rusty gate. Morning, Commissioner. You sent for me? Steve, I'm sending you to London to check on the arrival of a political refugee named Nikolai Deborov. Act as his bodyguard. I gather this Mr. Deborov is a very important gent. Actually, he's a big nothing. What? He doesn't even exist. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You're sending me to bodyguard a guy who doesn't exist? What's this all about? Steve, you've heard of the Freedom House, haven't you? Yeah, an international organization financed through contributions made by private citizens here and in Europe. They maintain what are called friendship centers on the continent, feed, clothe, and house refugees from behind the Iron Curtain. Right. They've been doing a splendid job, Steve. But a short time ago, things started going haywire. Two refugees disappeared, men we were very much interested in. We'd hoped to bring them to America. I see. Someone in the organization put the finger on them, you think? I'm certain of it. Someone along the route in one of the friendship centers or in the London headquarters. And that's where I start, at the top, huh? Get over there, Steve. Give the non-existent Nikolai Deborov the big builder and show considerable concern over the fact that he hasn't arrived. Bait the trap and wait for the mouse, or in this case, the rat to make his move, huh? Exactly. Well, that's it, Steve. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Magnificent musical entertainment is yours for the dialing every Monday evening on the NBC radio network. Listen on most NBC stations to these great programs. The Railroad Hour with singing star Gordon McRae and guest artists from Musicdom's Hall of Fame. The Voice of Firestone, featuring Howard Barlow and the Firestone Orchestra and Chorus, in the melodies you enjoy hearing. And the Telephone Hour, with the music of Donald Voorhees and the Bell Symphonic Orchestra. And the Dinah Shore Show, NBC's new Monday night program, starring America's favorite songbird, Miss Dinah Shore. Yes, every Monday night, listen to the best musical entertainment on this NBC station. <laughs> Sure, I've got my assignment. Get over to London and set up a trap for someone who's putting the finger on certain political refugees we're interested in bringing to the U.S. Because of that someone, the refugees are winding up back where they started from, behind the Iron Curtain. It's Wednesday afternoon when my plane lands. Andy Wilmer of our embassy is there to meet me, and we drive on into London. I, uh, I thought it'd save you a little time, Steve, so I started checking on the Freedom House people as soon as I heard you were coming. Good deal. Let's start with the staff here in London. Margaret Harpool Tupper in charge. Spinster daughter of the late Bingo Tupper, big man in herrings. She's 50-ish, barges about in tweeds, flat heel shoes, pork pie hat and string tie. Very fond of Chutney, Gregory Peck and Bassett hounds. Not necessarily in that order, however. She sounds interesting. I, uh, I doubt if you'll find her in the office this afternoon, this being her day with the Amersham Bird Watchers Society. <laughs> <laughs> Who will I find in the office? A Polish girl named Maria Ostrovic, a refugee herself. She came to the organization a few years ago and is now Miss Tupper's secretary. Blonde, 24, very attractive. Oh. And you can stop drooling. She's having dinner with me tonight. Mm. <laughs> Look, Steve, I, uh, I don't think Maria could be mixed up in this. Any one of the directors at the various centers could have spotted the names on the list. Who else works here in the London office? Well, there's Penelope Hinden, a charming little scatterbrain. She's Miss Tupper's niece. Does some typing and most of the filing. Georgie helps her when he's around. Georgie? Rodescu, refugee from Romania. Spends only a few hours a day there. The rest of the time he's teaching violin. He also plays sidewalk engagements. That's the place up ahead on the corner.
Headquarters for Freedom House is located in a dark and musty old building in the heart of London's produce district. I make my way cautiously up the creaky stairs, and as I reach the second floor, a tall, thin gent in a badly battered corduroy jacket comes down the corridor toward me. A violin case is tucked under his arm. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I'm looking for the offices of Freedom House. Ah, I myself have just come from there. He's around the corridor. To your right, come, I show you. No, oh, don't trouble. I think I can... I myself am associated with the organization. Perhaps I may be of assistance. My name is Rodescu. George Rodescu. Mine's Mitchell. I'd like to see Miss Tupper. Uh, she's not in. Today is bird watching day. But Maria, uh, Miss Ostravik is here. Uh, in here, sir. Oh, Maria. Yes, George. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Miss Ostravik. Uh, Mr. Mitchell is seeking information. How do you do? Please. Sit down, Mr. Mitchell. Thanks. First, I think you'd better look at my credentials, Miss Ostrovic. Oh? Oh? A United States agent. Oh, who? Oh. I'm looking for a man traveling under the name of Nikolai Deborov. Aha! He's in some trouble, yes? No, no. My government is anxious to locate him. I'm to see that he gets to the U.S. safely. I see. And you have come to us because... He's uh, staying at one of your friendship centers on the continent. At least, we hope so. In that case, it will be a simple matter to find him. Let me see now. The lease for this month should be here. We have not yet consolidated them, but... Uh, Miss Penelope was working with it some time ago. Perhaps on her... Never mind, Georgie. I have them. Now, the name again, Mr. Mitchell. Deborah. Nikolai Deborah. The underground got him out of Hungary about two weeks ago. Give me a couple of the lists, and I'll give you a hand. I go through the motions, check the lists out of Paris, Antwerp, Rotterdam, Milan, Trieste, Maria, and Georgie, some through the rest, but, of course, the name Deborah doesn't show up. You said this man was traveling under the name Deborah. It is not his real name? No, it isn't. But if you were to tell me what... He wouldn't uh, use his real name. We also instructed him about that. We felt it wouldn't be advisable. Aha! He's in danger, eh? Of course, of course. Since your government is so anxious to get him safely to America, it stands to reason that there are those behind the Iron Curtain who would like to prevent it. That's right, Georgie. Look, Miss Ostrovic, would you do me a favor? Of course. Would you contact the various centers and check on this for me? Deborah must be found. Do you have a description of him? There is a possibility he might have been forced to assume another identity. You're right. Well, all I know about him is that he's in his late 50s, has a medium build, gray hair. Very well. I will send the wire immediately. I stick around and help Maria draft a message to all friendship centers, stressing the fact that the U.S. government is very, very anxious to locate one Nikolai Deborah. The bait is out now, and all I have to do is wait for someone to snap at it. The lights of London are just coming on when someone tugs at the line. A reply from our house in Munich, Mr. Mitchell. Let me see the wire, Maria. Mm -hmm. Hmm. According to this, a Hungarian refugee named Gorveg was at the center there two days ago. The description we gave them fits, but they want more details on Deborah. His background, family, and profession. Uh Do, uh... Do we have this information to give them, Mr. Mitchell? Yeah, a little. I get to work on the reply to Munich. I don't give out with too much information, just enough to generate a little more excitement and interest. For Deborah's profession, I put politics. Maria sends off the wire, and I go on to my hotel a couple of hours later. I'm in the dining room putting the finishing touches to one of the specialties of the house when someone pulls up at my table. Hello, Steve. Hi, Andy. Sit down. Hey, I thought you had a date. Ah, It's off, thanks to you. Maria decided she'd better stick around the office. Oh, sorry. She tell you about the wire from Munich? Yeah. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? I'm already packed. Then unpacked. Huh? That's what I came over to tell you. Maria got another wire from Munich. The added info you sent didn't fit. The man they had in mind wasn't married, came from a different town, and was a bricklayer by profession. Oh, great. Yeah, the fish you thought you had at the end of your line turns out to be an old rubber boot. But uh, here's something that might interest you, since you seem to suspect any and all persons connected with Freedom House. What is it? I ran into Miss Tupper at the office a little while ago. She's invited us to drop around to her place for a saucer of brandy this evening. Oh? Yeah, she seems very anxious to cooperate. Feels that she might be of great help if you're willing to take her into your confidence. Okay, let's go around and have that saucer of brandy with M.H. Tupper. 
Well, that's the way it goes. Lose one lead and pick up another. It's not that I suspect the esteemed head of Freedom House of pulling any shenanigans, but it won't do any harm in having a chat with her. As we start across the lobby, the desk clerk gives me the high sign, a phone call. I slip into a booth, answer it, and half a minute later, I join Andy again. Anything important, Steve? Yeah, it was Maria. Oh? Any new developments? Looks like I won't have to unpack after all. According to your girlfriend, the non-existent Nikolai Deborov has just arrived in Antwerp. Steve Mitchell will continue his dangerous assignment in just a moment. Cancer is likely to strike anyone at any time. It hits men and women alike. It hits the young as well as the old. But many other patients are being saved because the disease is being detected and treated in time. Help the American Cancer Society to continue its year-round program of cancer research, education, and service to the cancer patient. Protect your own family by learning to recognize the seven danger signals of cancer. And remember, friends, that cancer strikes one person out of every five and one family in every two. The American Cancer Society needs your help to conquer this disease. Fight cancer with knowledge. Join the 1953 Cancer Crusade and give to conquer cancer. The research that you help support may someday save your life. Now back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. doesn't exist pops up at the Antwerp Friendship Center. That's right, Andy. Nikolai Deborah. Naturally, it's a plant, a lure for me. Right. They could be doing it to grab you off and pressure you into telling them who this mysterious and important refugee really is. Either that or maybe they want me to meet the phony so he can pump me a little. Are, uh, are you going along with it, Steve? I sure am. Okay. But keep your eyes open. Real open. <laughs> I grabbed the next plane to Antwerp, then a cab to the Friendship Center, a large villa on the outskirts of town. It's about 10 p.m. when I arrive. There's a high wall around the estate and an iron gate. Oh, lock. What do you want? Uh, oh, I didn't see you in the shadows. Ah, uh, what is it you want? Mainly to get through the gate. Why do you wish to get in? Look, before I answer any more questions, I want to know who's asking. Uh, of course, I'm Lieutenant Dijon. Lieutenant? Antwerp police. Oh, I see. Here, better take a look at my credentials, Lieutenant. Um, so, what can I do for you, Mr. Mitchell? How come you're at the Friendship Center? There has been a murder here. What? Yes, only half an hour ago. Who was killed? A man named Nikolai Debo. The name, of course, hits me right over the head. No sooner does somebody snap at my bait than they knock the bait off and with it my only lead to find out where the leak is in the refugee organization. On the way up the path, I fill Lieutenant DeJou in on the deal. He takes me to the dead man's room and pulls back a corner of the sheet. As you see, a man in his 50s, medium build, gray hair. The same general description you gave them in London of the non-existent Deborah. Yeah. Doesn't take a very close look to see that his hair's been dyed gray. Knife in the chest, huh? Yes. Okay. A search of the form revealed only his clothing and some charred fragments of newspaper in the fireplace. Well, we know this guy was a plant. True, true, but why was he killed? Two possibilities. If he was a foreign agent, maybe one of the refugees here in the villa recognized him and killed him for revenge. Mm, possibly. On the other hand, if he was a hired stooge, maybe he was planted here and then knocked off for me to find. That would cross Deborah off our books and... The other team would then continue looking for the real Deborah quietly. But there is no such thing as the real Deborah. They don't know that, or they wouldn't have taken the bait. How are you fixed for leads or suspects, Lieutenant? Well, besides the victim here, there are only three people in this villa at the time of the murder. 
The rest were attending an English school in town. I have definitely established that. Okay. Let's start talking to the three. We can start with Josef Gassis. Also a refugee? Yes, from the once independent state of Lithuania. His room is just down the hall. I ask him to remain inside. Ah, ah, here we are. Oh, oh, L Lieutenant Dijoux. This is Mr. Mitchell, a U.S. agent. He has some questions to ask you. Oh, but of course. You're a refugee, Joseph? Yes, from Lithuania. I arrived two days ago by boat. I plan to go on to Amsterdam and find employment. I am watch repairman. I see. You were here in the villa all evening, huh? Yes, yes. Reading here in my room. You hear anything from the dead man's room? I hear slight commotion, but do not pay much attention to it. Ah, uh, uh, that must be Falberg. Who's he? The director of this place. He went to get the other refugees at the school in town. I will go see. Mm. Joseph, getting back to the dead man, did you meet him? Deborov? Oh, yes. I talked with him briefly when he arrived this afternoon. Hungarian, he say. He seemed very nice. Also the girl. Girl? Yes. Johanna Guben is her name. A refugee from eastern Germany. She and Deborov arrived together this afternoon. I see. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, this is Falberg, director of this refugee center. How do you do? Mr. Falberg, were you here at the time of the murder? Yes, downstairs in the kitchen. But I saw and heard nothing. What can you tell me about the dead man? Deborah? Mm. Very little. This afternoon, as usual, I drove the station wagon to the square opposite the cathedral. That is the pick-up point for refugees. There were two of them waiting. Deborah and Johanna Gubin? Yes. I drove them here and sent a cable to our London headquarters announcing Deborah's arrival. I had been notified that you were inquiring about him. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, that'll be all for now. Lieutenant? Uh, yes. Please do not leave the villa without my permission. Uh, either of you. All right. Very well. Well, Mr. Mitchell, what do you make of it? Not very much so far, Lieutenant. Maybe I'll know a little more when we've talked to this Johanna Gubin. A little more about what? Oh, Miss Gubin? Yes. My name's Mitchell. Here are my credentials. I see. How long had you known the dead man, Deborah? Only a few hours. Oh? I met him in the square opposite the cathedral. And you'd never seen him before that? No. Where were you at the time of the murder? Why, right here in the parlor. As you see, they provide magazines and newspapers for us. Any idea where the others were at the time? As far as I know, Joseph was in his room. He and I chatted down here a few minutes, then he went upstairs. Falberg, I think, was in the kitchen. Okay. That'll be all for now, Miss Gubin. I will be up in my room. Okay. M Mr. Mitchell, a question? What is it? Why is an American agent so interested in an ordinary refugee like Deborah? Well, let's just say he wasn't so ordinary. I see. Good night. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, she's the only one who asked that question. Uh, a logical question for an innocent person to ask. Yeah, and a good cover for a guilty one. Lieutenant and I go over the case again, but can't come up with any new answers. Finally, he leaves. I go up to the room Fallberg has provided me and stretch out on the bed. I'm just dozing off when I hear soft footsteps in the hall. I ease to the door, open at a crack. It's Johanna Gubin heading downstairs. I follow her. Down in the parlor, she starts thumbing through newspapers. <laughs> Insomnia, maybe? What? Oh, Mr. Mitchell. I did not get a chance to look through all the newspapers. What's so interesting in them? The Paris editions. I am looking for a message from Papa in the personal columns. Oh, your father's in Paris? Yes. I am to join him there when I find his message in the papers. Why the secrecy? Papa is a refugee from eastern Germany, Franz Gubin, noted for medical research. If they knew where he was, they would try to force him to go back. I see. But I don't see the advertisement anywhere. Perhaps it is in the paper Joseph took upstairs to read. Oh, funny. I... What is it? Uh, nothing, Johanna. Wait. Here is the advertisement. Yes. Wanted. Helper for medical research. And the address in Paris. 
Papa is safe. I'm glad to hear it. Good night. I head upstairs fast. Something Johanna had said started things clicking. I go to the dead man's room in the fireplace. Yeah, the charred fragments of newspaper the lieutenant mentioned earlier. Then I make another discovery. One of the fragments is smoldering. Things add up fast now. I bound down the hall to Joseph's room. It's empty. Then out the window I spot a figure moving in the garden. I ease out the back and along the garden path, but I'm in too much of a hurry suddenly. He's in behind me with a gun. Far enough, Mitchell. Hello, Joseph. I guess you overheard Johanna tell me about the paper you took upstairs. Yes. I checked Deborah's room and discovered I had not burned it completely in my hurry. I tried to finish it off just now. I take it the dead man was your stooge. Yes. When we heard you were looking for a man named Deborah, we decided to come up with one of our own. That would give us time to set a trap for the real Deborah, who seems to be so important to you. Why'd you kill him? He became too curious. Unfortunately, in the process, he fell on the newspaper and stained it. I figured it was something like that. Open the gate, Mitchell. An old friend of yours is waiting out there in the car. Oh? You see, you really did not rush me very much. I was planning to leave anyway. Open the gate. It's now or never. I open the gate and walk through with Joseph behind me. Suddenly, I kick back at the gate hard. It swings into Joseph. The shot goes wild. I lost the gun out of his hand, then run to the parked car. George, get away! Get away! George Radescu, the violin player from London headquarters. Oh, ho, Mitchell. Hello, George. Long way from home, aren't you? Joseph, you fool to let him get your gun away from you. Uh-huh. Well, you sat there stupidly watching. Now, now, boys, flattery will get you nowhere with each other. Well, looks like I've got the crop. George in London puts the finger on the refugees, and Joseph does the dirty work. <laughs> Both of you hooked by the little man who wasn't there. What do you mean? We just used the name Deborah as bait, gents. There's no such person. What? You know, you guys brag that nobody can get the best of you. Well, nobody just did. Our star, Brian Donlevy, will return in just a moment. Variety is the spice of life, they say, and variety is what we at NBC attempt to give you each Thursday evening. Yes, each Thursday on most NBC stations, you'll hear such entertaining programs as The Roy Rogers Show, Father Knows Best, Truth or Consequences, The Judy Canova Show, and Eddie Cantor Show Business Show. Roy Rogers brings Western song and adventure from the Double R Bar Ranch in Paradise Valley. Later, it's time for Father Knows Best, with Robert Young in the title role. And perhaps you'll agree that the thing about which Father Knows Best is trouble. But trouble or not, there's always fun-filled listening when it's time for Robert Young to star on this station. Ralph Edwards brings you truth or consequences, and the action really begins when a contestant misses a question and has to pay the consequences. Judy Canova adds to the mirth and merriment with hilarious comedy and some songs in her own delightful style. Then Eddie Cantor brings you his show business show, during which he reminisces about his years in the entertainment world. Yes, every Thursday, listen to all of these fine shows on most NBC stations. <laughs> Next week, a little game of hide-and-seek on an island out in the not-so-Pacific. And that will be Steve Mitchell's dangerous assignment next week. <laughs> Featured in tonight's cast were Paul DeBosch, Tony Barrett, Jeannie Bates, Jan Arvan, and Jeannie Tatum. This is John Storm speaking. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian John Doe and directed by Bill Carn. Join us again next week at the same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another transcribed Dangerous Assignment. Fridays, listen to Best Plays on NBC.